Hey, welcome back. In this video, I want to start talking about subspaces in linear algebra. So typically, when you're first introduced to subspaces in linear algebra, you're just given the definition and the three conditions that it needs to meet. The definition is that it's a space within another space that includes the zero vector, that is closed under vector addition, and is closed under scalar multiplication. And then you're just given a handful of examples, and then you move on without really thinking too much about what all these things mean. So we're going to come back to this, but I think the way that I prefer to, uh, to be introduced to the idea of subspaces is by thinking about vector spans, uh, the spans of sets of vectors. And we've already been doing that in the last couple of videos talking about linear independence and, uh, and vector combinations and linear combinations and that sort of thing. So basically the, the definition of span is the span of a set of vectors is the set of all linear combinations of those vectors. And basically when you have a set of vectors in some vector space, so let's say that's like R2 or R3 or R100, whatever it is, just call it in general terms Rn, um, then a set of vectors can span Rn, or it can span a subspace of Rn. So anytime you're thinking about subspaces, you should immediately just frame the question in your head that this is a question about vector span, and, uh, and, and that's basically it. So let's draw coordinate axes for R2. And if we draw on two vectors, let's say we got vector V, and uh, some other vector that's not parallel. Uh, so we can just put something like this. We'll call that vector u. Then we know from previous videos that if we have a set of vectors, u and v, and they're not parallel and they're in R2, then the span of the set of vectors is going to be all of R2 because there is, if you take every possible combination, linear combination of the scaled up and scaled down versions of these vectors, there will be, you'll be able to create through vector addition any other vector that exists in R2. So u and v would span all of R2. But if you had another vector that's parallel to one of these, let's call this uh, w, and if we take w and v as our set, uh, so just ignoring u there I guess, um, then the sum of all linear combinations of e, uh, W and V does not span all of R2 because they're parallel to each other. They're both drawn in standard position and they're passing through the origin. Basically, any scaled up and scaled down version uh, or combination of these two vectors is just going to give us uh, another vector that lies in this line. And this line is basically a subspace of R2 because like with u and v, their span is all of R2. Um, if, we're, if we have a span that's anything less than the entire vector space that we're working in, then it's called a subspace. And something immediately that we can recognize is that if we have a vector space with n dimensions, so in this case R2, it's got two dimensions, and our subspace, which is a line, only has one dimension because lines are really just one dimensional shapes or or a better word to call them is spaces really. Now there's really an infinite number of potential subspaces that could exist like if you took a if you had a set of vectors that it was uh, included u and uh, this other vector let's call this like vector z and they're parallel to each other then the sum of all of these linear combinations are just going to form a different line uh, that's going to be like this it's parallel to the two original vectors and this would also be the subspace that's created by taking the span of the set of vectors of u and z. So subspaces are always the results of basically the spans of sets of vectors. And uh, now we can talk about maybe these points. When we say that it includes a zero vector, so we always draw these in standard position, and you can pretty easily imagine that if we multiplied these vectors all by zero and added them together, that we're going to result in the zero vector. Um, that's just part, uh, that's just part of this definition. It just kind of exists. You don't need to think too much about it, to be honest. But just think, always draw stuff in standard position, and uh, and then obviously the zero vector uh, in your brain will will click that yeah, this thing should be including the zero vector. Um, when we say that it's closed under vector addition, it means that if you have um, any two vectors that are in your subspace and you add them together, 
that the resultant vector is still in your subspace. So when we have these parallel vectors and we add them together, we get another third vector that is also parallel to the original two. Same when we look at u and v. Um, R2 in itself is closed under vector addition, you can imagine, because if we had u and v, the blue one plus the green one, it's going to come up somewhere like this. We would get this resultant vector that would basically, we can even draw it on. If we had u plus v, it's going to come somewhere like that. And uh, we would get this resultant vector that is basically just, well, I, I guess it will be pointing straight up, but it's still in the plane uh, that we're working in, it's still in the plane of R2. Um, so R2 itself is closed under uh, vector addition, but so are subspaces. So what a subspace is not is like a smaller two-dimensional area within R2. For example, like a box. Um, this is not a subspace because if you had two vectors that lived in this subspace, you had this one and you had this one, then if you added those two together, you're going to get something like this. And the resulting vector is going to be outside of that little square. And so this little square is not closed under vector addition, and this little square is not a subspace. And the other thing too with subspaces is that they're closed under scalar multiplication. So if you have a vector in your subspace, let's look at this one again um, with the red dashed line. If we take vector v, this green one, and we take any, any possible scalar multiple of it, like uh, that the resultant vector after we multiply a scalar to it is still going to be in that subspace. So for a straight line, that's going to hold true because we can stretch this out as much as we want this way or shrink it down or stretch it out that way. It's always going to be in that subspace. If you think about a small square with inside, within R2, again, if we had some vector that lived in this square and we, uh, you know, we just uh, multiplied it by some scalar that's big enough to bring it outside of the square, then uh, basically this vector is not existing inside this smaller square and this square is not closed under scalar multiplication and this square is not a subspace. So that's why I don't like just opening up with this original definition saying a subspace is a space within another space because this is immediately what I think when someone tells me that like, oh, it's a small square inside of a big square. Um, but that's not exactly how it works, and that's not how it works in R3 or in any other vector space either. That's why I prefer considering these as just like vector span problems right from the get-go. All right, so let's set up some axes for R3 as well, and then let's draw on just a couple of vectors here. I'm going to draw first some three vectors that are each one of them is going to be pointing right in line with each of the axes. These three vectors basically form an independent set of vectors. None of them are parallel to each other. They're all perpendicular to each other. This is like your perfect basis for R3. Um, we even call it standard basis for R3, but that's not the point of this video. Um, if you take every possible linear combination of these three vectors, then it's going to span all of R3 because every scaled up and scaled down version of these vectors added to each other, you can hopefully easily see that we could describe any other position vector that we want. Um, but if we consider this, if we take away one of these vectors, let's say the, the z vector, or the one that's in line with the z axis, um, and just first of all look at these two vectors that are pointing in uh, the x and y direction. And sometimes we call these like, if, they, if these have a magnitude of 1, we call them like the i, j, and k vectors, if you remember from earlier in the course. Um, but basically what's going on here is that these two vectors, let's see if I can draw this, uh, they're forming a plane, like the set of all linear combinations of just these two vectors is going to form a plane that can actually, it will it will be infinite in the y direction, positive and negative, and infinite in the x direction, positively and negatively. So it doesn't just stop here, it basically spans the entire xy plane. And if we only had these two vectors, um, well really like their, their components, if we called this um, yeah, let's call this vector i and let's call this vector uh, j. So i is 1, 0, 0 and j is 0, 1, 0. So i and j together don't span all of R3. They just span the plane that is the xy plane. And that is a subspace in R3 because it is 
it will it includes a zero vector it's closed under vector addition because any possible combination of these two is still going to end up with another vector in that plane and it's closed under scalar multiplication because any scaled up or scaled down version of any of these vectors by themselves is also going to be in this plane. Now if we added in a third vector like this that's in this plane as well um, and let's just call this like vector z and we could say that vector z is going to be something like 1 1 0 give or take then this doesn't actually change the span of the set of vectors because this, the span of the set of vectors that include i, j, and z is still just the x, y plane. Now, something else that we could do is if we got rid of vector z and, uh, and vector i, if we just kind of ignored that for now, and then we drew on another vector that was like this, and we could just call this negative j. Um, you know, it's got the, the the components that are like 0, negative 1, and 0. Basically, it is parallel to j. Then we could just add up all of the linear combinations of these, and we're going to find that it is this line that basically just matches up with the y-axis. And this line is also a subspace in R3 because it includes a 0 vector, it's closed under vector addition, and it's closed under scalar multiplication. Now, if we have slightly more interesting vectors, like that aren't just the unit vectors, um, but are parallel to each other, and, and we can have two vectors that are parallel to each other, or 100 vectors that are parallel to each other, um, basically they can be going in any kind of direction, so we can get basically an infinite number of lines, and the same thing for for planes. The plane doesn't have to be lined up with like the xy plane or the yz plane, if you imagine that you draw two vectors on a piece of paper, uh, that piece of paper is like a plane, and it lives in R3 because so do we. And if you actually pick it up and like rotate it around through space in front of you, then each of the infinite ways that you can orient it are their own subspace in R3, because no matter what, those two vectors that you drew on it will always basically describe that plane, and that plane will be closed under vector addition and scaling multiplication. So, the, so in R3, Maybe we should write that up here. Um, a subspace can be a plane, and a subspace can be a line. And basically a plane has two dimensions and a line has one dimension, and one and two are both less than three, which is how many dimensions there are in three. Whereas in R2, a subspace is just a line. Again, it has less dimensions than the entire vector space. So we can we can take this exact same logic and we can extend it to any number of dimensions. So this works in Rn, R100. Basically, in general, it works in Rn. Um, it stops making sense, speaking about lines and planes and, and things like that, as we start increasing the number of dimensions in our vector space. But as long as you do follow these rules, or more importantly, or maybe just as importantly, remember that subspaces are characterized by the spans of sets of vectors, um, then as long as you're not spanning Rn, then you're going to be spanning some kind of subspace. So subspaces are weird, but hopefully, hopefully this video helps. Um, yeah, it maybe just provides a little bit more insight than, than just opening up a textbook and reading these three lines and, and not really thinking too much about what it means and how it relates to the other things that we already know in linear algebra. So thanks for watching guys, and uh, I'm going to cut it off here, but I will see you in the next video where we're going to talk about finding a basis for a subspace.